from the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, bringing you data-driven insights from the Cube and ETR. This is Breaking Analysis with Dave Vellante. The chaos caused by today's CrowdStrike content update shows that even the most successful cybersecurity firms with great management, award-winning products, and a growing business are exposed to unexpected events. What's even more important is that it underscores the fragi fragility of our connected world and the critical infrastructure that makes it run. Virtually every industry, and who knows how many people, were affected directly by the update. CrowdStrike pushed it out. And the, but the focus right now is on getting their customers back online. It's an on-the-job training session in disaster recovery and business resiliency. Now, ETR has conducted a flash survey of 100 CrowdStrike customers, and 96% of those 100 were affected by the outage. 55% say they're rethinking their consolidation stack plans around CrowdStrike or looking at reducing reliance on CrowdStrike. Now, we know from other incidents that some, some end up being more benign and they fade over time, while others cause reputational damage and, and business damage. The broad industry impact of this in incident is cause for concern, and while it's too early to draw any conclusions with respect to the long-term financial impact on CrowdStrike, suffice it to say that the short-term reaction from customers is very bad. Hello, and welcome to this week's theCUBE Research Insight, powered by ETR. In this breaking analysis, we give you our assessment of the events of July 19th related to the CrowdStrike content push and update, what we know, and what the potential exposure could be to the company. We'll share a glimpse ETR flash survey and talk about what's next in this saga. You remember the flash crash, crash of May 2010? It was an event where for no clear reason, the market dropped 600 points in a matter of minutes. Blue chip stocks like Accenture became like worth a penny for a few minutes before the market rebounded. In his book, Flash Boys, Michael Lewis cited the opaque nature of so-called software glitches and cited growing concerns over the lack of transparency stemming from the SEC's obscure response. Well, this incident shone a light on the risks of our increasingly digital world. Mind you, this was 14 years ago. The recent CrowdStrike incident, while highly impactful, was not a black box. George Kurtz, the CEO of CrowdStrike, appeared on several TV programs this morning, including CNBC. He took responsibility for the industry. He was humble. As was Todd McKinnon, you may recall, CEO of Okta a couple of years ago when he had to take the shrapnel for a breach. We knew early on this was not a cyber attack. Rather, it was from a push CrowdStrike initiated to update a content file. Our understanding is that generally an update in this context refers to a content push that includes new data or rules used by security sensors to detect and respond to threats. A report on Hacker News and all over Twitter suggests that CrowdStrike pushed a new driver to the kernel of Windows clients to fix an issue with an earlier version of its Falcon sensor, which was having latency issues. This has not been confirmed uh, by SiliconANGLE or the company as at this time, but according to Kurtz, the issue was identified and then rolled back. Before it could be fully contained, it hit a number of Windows systems. Our understanding is Windows server and PCs, which caused the blue screen of death continuous loop of impossible to eliminate blue screens, even if you hit control, all delete, rebooting. As we said, virtually every industry was impacted, thousands, perhaps millions of people, while some fixes could be initiated by a re via a reboot because there are so many permutations and combinations of Windows, OS configs, many systems need to, need to be recovered manually. Now, to be clear, other than the fact that companies are running many versions of Windows, this is not a Windows issue. It certainly was not, to our understanding, a security failure of Windows or a process failure on Microsoft's end or on the end of CrowdStrike's IT customers. It appears that this was an automated push initiated by CrowdStrike, but we're still trying to get the details there. So a lot of questions and things this incident brings to light. Let's take a look at some. The first question one would ask is, why wasn't this staged? And George Kurtz explained to Jim Cramer on TV today that it was staged. Now, the follow-up question that we have that wasn't asked is, were customers given the option of holding off on this push and timing it on their own terms? If not, why not? Is this standard operating procedure? 
or was this a process fail? Why were only Windows systems affected? What Was this a Windows issue? No. This, as we said before, this was not a Windows issues appear, issue or an Azure issue. It appears to be a CrowdStrike issue that was rolled back before it hit Mac's, uh, uh, Mac computers and Linux systems. So that's why uh, it didn't hit those because of the rollback. And it was stayed. Why are some Windows systems back online and some others? It's because there are so many permutations, as we said, of Windows and so many configurations that automations and reboots might not fix them. So how do systems get fixed? Well, some can be fixed with a reboot and through automation, but many are still down and needing manual intervention. IT departments are scrambling, working with cloud vendors to recover. According to one thread on Hacker News, I'll just read it to you. Most of our nodes are boot looping with blue screens, which in the cloud is not something you can just hit F8 and remove the driver. We have to literally take each node down, attach, to the, 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 attach the disk to a working node, delete the .sys file, and bring it back up. Either that or bring up a new node entirely from a snapshot. This is fine, but EC2 is rammed with people doing this right now. It's taking forever, and storage latency is through the roof, unquote. Okay, who's responsible for this mistake? CrowdStrike is taking responsibility for this hit, at least so far, and it appears it was CrowdStrike's automated push that potentially bypassed any customer's ability to stage the push themselves. And again, this is probably a common occurrence. It's probably standard operating procedure. What isn't common common is a bug in the software that takes the internet down. My colleague, Alex Meyerson, who runs production uh, and does our podcast, asked me, is this what was supposed to happen on January 1st, 2000? Um, yeah, that's right. This is what it was supposed to look like. So the other question is, does CrowdStrike really have kernel level access to all these devices? And the answer is yes, they do. Falcon has privilege access. They've earned that privilege, but many customers will be revisiting their processes. And you may be asking, are companies really still running their business on Windows Server and older versions of Windows uh, on their PCs? And yes, the answer is absolutely. Still a lot of .NET out there, tons of C++, there's COBOL even. The big question for investors is what is the damage to the economy? Who knows? And it, we know it was expensive. Pick your cost of downtime, multiply it by the number of businesses and people affected, and, and, and you know what is the damage to reputational and financial to CrowdStrike? That's the other big question that investors have, and that's to be determined. Okay, let's go through some of the other factors here, and what I'd like to do is bring up the next chart, if you would, Alex. So what we've done here is taken a look at the market reaction and the exposure uh, to try to assess the exposure that CrowdStrike has. So this is a stock chart, shows the NASDAQ in the yellow. The blue line is CrowdStrike. It opened up uh, this morning. It opened down 15%. It recovered. It was down, you know, actually high single digits for a while. And then um, you can see uh, as of uh, later in the day, uh, 2.30 or so Eastern time, uh, it's back down to almost down 13%. CrowdStrike's on track for $4 billion in revenue in fiscal 25. It had... <clears throat> Had, a, had a, over an $80 billion market cap uh, going into this morning or ending last night. It's now $74 billion or even lower now. Uh, it was down eight, probably now down closer to $10 billion today. Sentinel up uh, midday was up, uh, Sentinel-1 rather, was up 9% midday, and Palo Alto was up a point and a half. NASDAQ, as you can see in that uh, yellow line, was roughly flat. Again, it's unclear what type of legal exposure CrowdStrike has um, but it's very clear that the industries uh, uh, affected were truly across the board. Um, and so let's take a look at some of the ETR data now. We're going to get into the flash survey. It just came in prior to uh, our recording time here, but let's dig into some of the ETR data. Uh, and you can see here on, on this chart, what we're showing here is the net score granularity. We've talked about this a lot on breaking analysis. Net score is ETR's proprietary methodology that breaks down a company's spending patterns over time. So this is the percent of customers that are adding CrowdStrike 
new. That's the lime green. So you can see July 24 survey, this month's survey, it's 11% of the 400 plus customers in the survey, CrowdStrike customers, are adding CrowdStrike new. The lime green, or sorry, the, the forest green at 44% is spending more than 6%. The gray at 38% is is flat, plus or minus 5%. The pinkish area is spending less. I think that's 3%, so that's pretty pretty small. That's spending 6% or, or worse. And then you can see the leaving the platform or putting it into containment, that bright red, that's 4%. You, sub, you subtract the reds from the greens and you get net score. That's that blue line, which relative to October 2023 has popped up. Uh, you can see relative to July 2023, it's 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 about the same. So it's it's back up. It's it's at very high levels. Uh, uh, CrowdStrike that is, and so you know we've been we've been focused on CrowdStrike for many many years now, and we we've talked about we saw their ascendancy during uh, the uh, COVID, and we reported on that extensively. Let's take a look at how they focus, how they relate to their peers on this this next chart here. It shows net score, which we just showed you and defined with the granularity on the on the vertical axis, and it shows pervasion or or the 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 presence in the data set on the horizontal axis. This is just for the cybersecurity sector. Anything over that forty percent line is considered highly elevated, and so you can see CrowdStrike is way up there. Microsoft, of course is up there as well and way to the right. Microsoft, I would say, is CrowdStrike's biggest competitor. In fact, you know, George Kurtz is often, you know, very often quoted as saying, good enough security is not good enough. He's talking about Microsoft. Uh, there's another joke in the, in the CrowdStrike community that Patch Tuesday means Hack Wednesday. Uh, and so CrowdStrike's all about speed. The premise that George Kurtz Kurtz puts forth is you got to be fast. You got to be faster than the bad guys. He drives race cars. He emphasizes the importance of speed and in you know finding things and remediating things quickly, which probably led to this culture of fast pushes. They probably wanted to you know do the best for their customers, and as a result, are pushing things out you know potentially without giving them an opportunity to to slow them down. But in this case, it backfired. And again, potentially, we're speculating there. But it appears that's the case. But you can see CrowdStrike at well over 40%. Palo Alto is right there as well. Zscaler. You can see Sentinel-1 uh, is, is also you know, right there, a big endpoint competitor. Fortinet you know, has some products in that space, as does Cisco. And you can see a num number of others, Sophos, Trend Micro, um, et cetera. And so you know, CrowdStrike, very prominent position here. Um, and so they're, that, that's how they've been able to get such a strong market presence and such a, a high valuation relative to the others. But let's take a look now at the flash survey results from ETR. As I said, in the flash survey, uh, the, the ETR asked the question, uh, were you impacted by this? It was, it was just 100 customers, which is awesome. ETR is so, so amazing. They're able to get out and get a feedback from 100 customers to today, 96% out of that 100 said they were impacted. And you can see here the degree of impact. On a scale of one to six, how significant was the impact of these outages on business operations? 40% said five, extremely or very significant. Most business operations experienced significant delays or were halted entirely. That's money. That is money down the drain. 6% said extremely significant. Our business had to shut down nearly all essential operations. Wow. 22% said somewhat significant non-essential business operations were halted temporarily. And then to the left. So look, 43, 53, a little more than half, 55% were yeah, pretty benign. But 46% had a significant impact. And as you see here in the second red red line, 50% uh, are reconsidering their situation with CrowdStrike, either rethinking how they're consolidating their stack 
around CrowdStrike, which is a big theme of CrowdStrike and a big part of their value proposition, or uh, they're looking at reducing uh, their exposure in CrowdStrike. All right, let's take a look at the final chart here and share with you the overlap in the accounts, Alex, if you would bring that last chart up. So what this shows is just Microsoft accounts. Okay, so these are the ones that were affected. This is a Windows issue. And in the ETR survey, Microsoft is the most prominent company. You can see down the left filtered in there, 1,538 Microsoft accounts in the, uh, in the survey. We just did the generic Microsoft. We didn't click off all the other alternatives. We could have got that number up higher. The vertical axis here is, is shared net score, and the horizontal axis is overlap. So we're measuring the, mo the spending momentum, as we defined earlier, with that net score granularity. And the horizontal axis is the, the overlap within those 1,500 accounts. So you can see CrowdStrike has a 26% overlap, so 26% of those Microsoft accounts also have CrowdStrike uh, and 15% have Sentinel-1. We chose Sentinel-1 because it's it's probably the one of the closest uh, comparisons. Palo Alto as well, because these are both platform companies. And you can see Palo Alto has the biggest presence with an N in the upper right there in that table of 478, followed by CrowdStrike with 401. We didn't put Cisco on there. Cisco, you know, heavy in network security, would have skewed the data a little bit. These guys are more pure play uh, security companies, even though security is a big part of Cisco's business. And you can also see both CrowdStrike and Palo Alto have net scores well over the 40% marker. In the case of CrowdStrike, 47%, Palo Alto right at the 40% mark. And you can see how the others play there. We've also selected Tanium, Sophos, Malwarebytes, Trellix, which used to be Mac McAfee and, and, and FireEye, Carbon Black and Trend Micro, all of which have endpoint security products, and you can see the relative overlap there. I think the point is that CrowdStrike really has a big presence, a relative presence in these accounts, and it's going to be really important for us to gauge how that initial negative reaction that we saw from the ETR survey, how that plays out in the next round of surveys. Let's... Um, Let's close with the last slide, which we're calling Wake Up Call for Organizations. And this really underscores the perils of digital transformation and automation. These were on display today. We call it GRS. Getting rid of stuff in IT is always, always a challenge. Um, this is something that we've looked at for years. I just, I, we mentioned that there's, there's still even, even uh, COBOL uh, around th these days. So, Look, you know, yes, people are running their business on Windows and, and Windows Server. Uh, there's still, as we said earlier, a lot of .NET uh, going on, and that creates technical debt and a lot of leg legacy infrastructure. This just means more permutations. I mean, so many different ways to configure uh, Windows. And, you know, folks like CrowdStrike, they spend a lot of time and a lot of money making sure that they can manage all those different con configurations. Uh, but in this case, you know, as we've seen, it's uh, turned into a real nightmare for the company. Um, so far, CrowdStrike's communications has been very humble. We'll give them props for that. It's been transparent. Uh, but, y you know, <laughs> we don't know everything yet. And it's, it's really hard. Uh, uh, George Kurtz was getting uh, asked a lot of questions that he didn't have answers to. His focus right now is on the customers. Uh, would not be surprising to me, given the extent of this, that George is going to be, you know, brought in to face Congress. He's going to have, you know, a lot of hostile people, a lot of finger wagging. Um, if in fact this was a situation, and I don't want to explain, speculate too much, but based on the the comments that we've seen on Twitter and in Hacker News and other IT organizations, it does appear that CrowdStrike you know, pushed this update and got the kernel level access because it, it has that privilege. And so that's going to, um, to be a really interesting source of concern for people, for customers, and for, you know, other industries that were affected. And we'll see how litigious uh, these organizations get. I mean, the economic impact 
could be huge. So, you know, at some point, you know, CrowdStrike will have to limit its liability, but that's, it's premature right now. So much is unknown, uh, again, including how aggressive these effective organizations uh, are going to be toward CrowdStrike. So we'll have more information as time goes on. Uh, we're going to leave it there for now. What have you heard? Share with us. Uh, again, we don't want to speculate too much, but there's a lot of information floating around in threads, uh, on Twitter, in Hacker News, uh, in Reddit, in other places. Um, we've reached out to s several of our IT contacts. Many have said, you know, we're in recovery hell right now, uh, but we will be unpacking the anatomy of, uh, of this downtime, of this update, this push, and the impact it's had on the business. So we're going to leave it there for now. But let us know what you know. Thank you very much to Alex Meyerson for your contribution to today's podcast and uh, uh, or uh, uh, breaking analysis, and also Ken Schiffman on production. Alex also does our podcast. Kristen Martin and Cheryl Knight help get the word out on social media and in our newsletters. And Rob Hof is our EIC over at siliconangle.com. Uh, you'll find uh, John Furrier also has an article there today. He's got a thread going out on LinkedIn. So definitely want to check that out. Remember, all these episodes are available as podcasts. Wherever you listen, all you got to do is search Breaking Analysis Podcast. They publish each week on thecuberesearch.com and siliconangle.com. You can email me at david.vellante at siliconangle.com. DM me at dvellante or comment on my LinkedIn post. And check out etr.ai. Uh, these guys are amazing. The fact that they could organize a um, hundred CrowdStrike customers and get instant, virtually instant feedback. It just underscores how awesome these people are, their data science team, their database, their relationships with customers. We are so grateful for our partnership with ETR. This is Dave Vellante for the Cube Research Insights powered by ETR. Thanks for watching, everybody, and we'll see you next time on Breaking Analysis.